Alors, à partir de cette clé qu'on a là, s'il vous plaît, tout le monde en bas, s'il vous plaît. We all like to believe that no one can control the way we think. But there are many techniques that can be used to change the way our minds normally work. One is hypnosis. Respirez profondément en laissant les sentiments votre imagination. Anyone can be hypnotized, but only if they want to be. The stage hypnotist rejects those who don't instantly show that desire. Respire, respire. Fais jouer une musique, quelque chose, je suis vide. À toi, ça joue très fort. Un, deux, trois. Allez-y. Now the hypnotist only has to give this woman the suggestion she's a member of an orchestra. And immediately, she believes she is. Another suggestion, and the orchestra member becomes the conductor. In trance, people seem so easy to manipulate. I'm going to take your arm and just put it there. You can only be hypnotized if you believe in the power of the hypnotist. That's just fine, and you can just allow your eyes to close. You must accept him as an authority figure. Different people will accept different authority figures, depending on their needs and value systems. This man would never have faith in a stage hypnotist, but he's ready to believe in a doctor. And he wants to be hypnotized to get rid of his migraine headaches. Or maybe it's a sensation of warmth. I'd like you very slowly and comfortably to just allow that hand to float up over your head until you make contact, until you're able to touch very comfortably and securely back of your neck so that that really good feeling that you can feel in your hand that's right, very slowly, slowly, very comfortably, can be transferred to the back of your neck. Suggestions made to people in trance can not only change the way they act, but also the way they feel. Here, the patient becomes more suggestible to the doctor telling him to relax and control the pain. You can feel that comfort spreading from your hand into your neck. As the muscles become even more deeply relaxed, your head sinks down and you sink down. I think the experience of trance is really something that occurs for everyone spontaneously anyway, moments of reverie, um, of absorption, for example, while reading a, a novel or adventure story and becoming so engrossed in it that you really feel you're there and are oblivious even to somebody coming into the room at first. Um, but in hypnosis we have a series of, of techniques, of styles of communicating and relating with a person that facilitate their, their ability to experience trance, help them to enter a trance, and even more important, perhaps, help them to maintain a trance. What do you see? Chairs, desks. The extent to which a person in trance can be made suggestible is quite remarkable. This young man is wide awake and can even carry on a conversation. He tells the hypnotist exactly what he sees. He thinks he is seeing everything the way he normally does, but he's not. Anybody in the class? No, why? What do you mean? There's nobody in the class? Myself? Why? That's it? Yourself? Yeah. That's it. And? What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened? What do you mean, what happened? <laughs> you see that? Yeah. Hi, Joe. Hi. There's nobody in the classroom. You realize that? Yes, yeah, sir. So what are you sitting here doing? Talking to you. Talking to me? Yeah. Okay. It's time to go. Where? Home, I suppose. It's finished. Go. 
Yeah. But you can't go out of that door, you know that? Why? I don't know why. Try it. What's the matter? Can't get up, bro. Can't get up? No. You see that? His height. What I suggested simply is he can't get up. And how I interpret it is that he can't get up and he were to go out. Who are you talking to? <laughs> He's talking to somebody here. Who? Some people in the class. No? Where are they? You see? Yeah. What? What's what? Whom am I talking to? To me. And? Fine, fine. You see the switch? Are you with it? Huh? What switch? Huh? What switch? What switch? <laughs> you see anybody? No one. Now what is getting him in and out of? Can you figure it out? Yeah. yeah. Huh? If I watch this, now watch this movement. This means he's going into that heightened state of suggestibility. It's a non-verbal clue. That means he's out. Right. You see people? Yeah, why? Okay. What do you see? I see the classroom. Why? What? <laughs> huh? What did you say? What? You said something. I don't remember. What is it? See how swiftly he passes from one state of consciousness into another. Huh? What's happening? <laughs> Hypnosis is only one technique to put people into the suggestible state of trance. There are other methods that don't need a hypnotist. The oldest techniques used for inducing trance are rhythmic drumming, chanting, and dancing. Early in the history of every culture, it has been discovered that if you overload the senses, the stress will disrupt the way the mind normally works. This leads to disorientation and trance. Just like someone hypnotized, these Moroccan women no longer control the way they think. In the trance state, they may have visions which they interpret as instructions from gods or spirits. Or they may receive what they believe to be powers of prophecy or healing. <laughs> Highly structured industrial societies have abandoned many of the traditional techniques for inducing trance. And I want you now to use your imagination. Play the role, play the part in feeding your body relaxing as I ask you to do so. And the relaxing power is now... But recently, hundreds of thousands of people have rediscovered these techniques in such groups as EST, TM, LifeSpring, Silva Mind Control, and this one, run by Dick Sutphin. Completely relaxed, completely relaxed. Keeping your full attention now on the sound of my voice as a relaxing power comes into the fingers of both of your hands. The stated aim of all these groups is to use trance to expand consciousness. Sutphin's seminar plays on the belief in reincarnation. He suggests that while in trance, these people will travel back to a previous lifetime and to events in that lifetime which are the cause of a present-day personal problem. The next count, you will reach the end of the tunnel. You will step out and you will see yourself at the age of 15 in a previous lifetime. Letting go, moving backward, number one. To induce trance, Sutphin uses a combination of techniques. First, the tone of voice and delivery of a hypnotist. Then, the element of stress. Instead of drumming and chanting, he plays a repetitive electronic sound which he gradually increases in volume. Just let it out. Let go of the frustration. 
should let it out. The pounding rhythm and the exhortation to let go quickly have the desired result, disorientation and trance. Now they have an experience like that of the Moroccan women. Suitable visions and stories enter the mind. They come involuntarily, like dreams. Let go. Let go. Just begin to completely let go. Breathe deeply. You're letting Whether these life people life actually life. have visions of a past life is not the point. They believe they do. They believe they have pinpointed the root cause of a personal problem, and perhaps thinking they have found the cause will help them overcome it. For some reason, I had said something that betrayed the tribe. Afterwards, each person describes what they saw while in trance. They were leading me up this uh, stone, uh, these stone steps uh, to punish me. And uh, I could see all of these uh, faces. Uh, pretty angry, upset, and I realize now that I'm just terribly afraid of being embarrassed to uh, have people looking at me. Again, you have them lead you up the stone steps. It was, uh... What happened to you at the top of the stone steps? Well, I could just... I knew that I was going to, to be killed at that point, but I, you know, I tried to not go into that. And you can see how that's affecting you now. And I so they're not going to kill you today for saying I know, and I what just, you think. I have this, like I said, this fear of telling people what I think because I don't want to hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't realize before that that was uh, where it was coming from. Yeah. 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 Every single thing that we have going on for us, all of our negative feelings, our hang-ups, our fears, they're all coming from some event in our past. Whether or not we can pin it down and identify it in time. Okay, it's time now to be able to speak up and say what you feel you need to say, okay? Mm -hmm. Knowing that they're not going to sacrifice you to the Aztec gods or something. Let's acknowledge it. Yeah. see you to see if I could help you. Maybe maybe you could tell me what the what the problem is. That's that's the problem. I don't really know. The use of trance and suggestion to try to solve deep emotional problems has a long history. Psychiatry started exploring these methods in the nineteenth century. Charcot was interested in the in the psychiatric disorder called hysteria and he began using hypnosis uh, to command away symptoms.
Freud went and studied under him, who was highly impressed by the uh, the showmanship of Charcot and how he could uh, suggest a way symptom in his patients, and he started to use uh, hypnosis. But then uh, he he perhaps uh, was the main uh, the main originator of the idea that if you use direct suggestion and commanded away symptoms, well, they might temporarily disappear, but they would come up in another guise. Uh, you would command away that, uh, that paralysis, but uh, in a month's time, the patient would be uh, psychotically depressed or something of that sort. So he, he began to uh, see or, or feel that uh, direct suggestion and commanding away symptoms uh, didn't provide any long-term answer to the patient's conflicts. And then he began his talking cure, his uh, free association process and non-directive approach and uh, digging out stuff rather than suppressing it. I guess I feel I'm at a bit of a, a standstill. And uh, I don't know which direction to go. In this kind of therapy, Unlike hypnosis, the doctor makes every effort to avoid telling the patient what to do. Instead, she is encouraged to talk about her problems so she may come to a deeper understanding of their causes. I feel like I'm very alone. But even though there is no hypnotic trance, no direct commands, the doctor's influence can still be very strong. When I was saying about our ideal in, in Western uh, non-directive psychotherapy is not to use suggestions. And uh, some people say that we're just fooling ourselves when we say that, that there's as much uh, suggestion going on in uh, non-directive therapy as there is in uh, this kind of therapy I just describing. I've disappointed a lot of people. Disappointed people? Yeah, I think so. Though not in trance, this patient is under stress and emotionally overwrought, and she is in the presence of an authority figure she trusts and believes. In this situation, even though it is unintended, suggestions are almost certain to pass from doctor to patient. Yeah, because I had it can happen in subtle ways. The tone of voice, body language, how a question is asked. You felt that you shouldn't have had the relationship. Well, I felt I, sh I, should ha I should have it, but I guess in a way I felt I shouldn't as well. Almost at the t same time, I, I thought both things. Why shouldn't you have had it? I, uh... I went from being uh, looked after by one group of people to being looked after by another group of people. By one man? Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps that was wrong. So far, we have seen that people can be suggestible when they are under emotional stress and take indirect suggestions, which may have a long-lasting effect. And we have seen people become suggestible when in trance, and take direct suggestions, which change them for a short period of time. Now we will look at techniques which can be used to go much further, to change a person's fundamental belief system, and change it for life. His name is Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Thousands of people from all over the world come to him in Pune, India to become his disciples, his sannyasin. They come to listen to a doctrine which can lead to a new way of being. Rajneesh knows that it is easier to change people if you remove them from their normal environment and place them in one which you control. To maintain a stable sense of personal identity, Every one of us needs continual feedback and reinforcement from friends, family, and the society around us. But here the sannyasins stay in a commune 24 hours a day, surrounded by new friends, a new family, a new society. 
They all wear clothes of orange and are given a new name. All of this weakens their sense of former identity. Now they are told to look at themselves afresh using one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions and hours of meditation. It forces you to encounter yourself, your fidgetiness, your restlessness, your ugliness, your madness. It forces you to see all rubbish that you are carrying within yourself. And that is one of the most essential steps. If you want to go beyond anything, first you have to encounter it. Without encountering it, there is no transcendence. Jesus says, unless you are born again, you will not enter into my kingdom of God. This is the birth he is talking about. And this is the birth I am talking about. This is what sannyas is. A process of rebirth. A process of being born again. Is the sun behind the sun? Is the sun? A complete change of environment and personal habits is key to any personality change. When the sense of identity is shaken, people become more suggestible, and the time is ripe for an authority figure to step forward and tell them what to do, what to believe, what is right, what is wrong. Rajneesh also encourages trance states which increase suggestibility. These people came here looking for change, but like the psychiatrist's patient, they did not know what change to make. Now that they are in a suggestible state, Rajneesh tells them, surrender and accept me as the perfect master. And they do. opportunity. Words will always be available to you. But to be in communion with a living master is a rare opportunity. It happens only once in a while. God is the unknown, not only the unknown but the unknowable. Come. Again and again I say come because I may not be here for long.
Trappists, Benedictines, Jesuit novitiates. They live in isolation, cut off from the rest of the world. They take on a special set of clothes. They may even change their name. These monks have sought a new way of being, surrendering themselves to a perfect master. A perfect master who died some 2,000 years ago. Catholic orders not only control the physical environment, they also control the use of time. A good example can be seen in the training of a Jesuit. We got up in the morning at 5 or 5.30. We had a very short time to get dressed. We then uh, went to a visit in the chapel. We then meditated uh, for almost an hour. We then went to a place called the Assetory, which was just a big room with desks, and we uh, wrote down uh, some thoughts as a result of the meditation, a review of meditation. Then a bell rang, and I might say that I think 30 to 40 bells rang a day to divide the day up into very small lots. The idea was that as soon as the bell rang, you were to stop whatever letter you were writing. That didn't mean that if you were writing a letter to your mother, you stopped in the middle, it, it, middle of it. It meant if you were writing the letter A, you stopped in the middle of le writing the letter A. Rajneesh has to provide an exciting, almost orgiastic atmosphere to attract the followers he then converts. These monks don't have to be converted. They make the decision to surrender their lives to Christ before entering the order. Because of this commitment, they are more willing to accept stronger controls over the environment, not only the stringent control of time and space, but also abnormal restrictions like the rule of silence and the prohibition of sex. The novice, faced with this carefully controlled environment, must change. His old ways of thinking do not apply in this strange new world. He needs a new way of thinking, and his superiors are the only people available to tell him what that new way of thinking should be. The Jesuits use an extreme form of environmental control to build sufficient stress in the novice to bring him into a state of suggestibility. They don't use drumming or dancing, they use silence. Thirty days where all speech is forbidden and where meditation lasts several hours each day. Every waking moment is devoted to the teachings of Ignatius Loyola, the basis of the Jesuit faith. Your mind was focused on thoughts about God, about your purpose in life, about the four last things, about uh, birth, death, uh, judgment, hell, heaven. Now, you know, take 30 days of rather intense thinking and quote, praying, unquote, about those things, and you're bound to undergo at least a temporary change. At the core of this changed way of thinking is obedience. Obedience to the rules of the order. And above all, obedience to the head of the order, an authority figure you must obey because he alone can show you the true path to Christ. Well, of course, obedience, I think, is the cornerstone of, of the whole Jesuit system. And it was uh, made clear to us that uh, our immediate superior, who in the novitiate would have been the master of novices, uh, was there in the place of God, and uh, that uh, we were to uh, react to him without the slightest hesitation of any kind of, uh, of questioning. It was to be unquestioned obedience. Rajneesh and the Catholic Church can justify their methods by telling their followers it is God's will. The reward they offer is that change will lead to spiritual enlightenment. 
But what techniques can be used by groups more interested in worldly power than in saving souls? such a cross-section of kids mm. and hair long and short and all this type of thing as you come down to this thing uh, kids start getting nervous like one of the kids had gold he had a blue blazer on with a gold button so he started tearing them off because he heard they didn't like rich kids so he started pulling these things off and getting rid of the blazer and you know every guy started trying to square up to where he didn't stick out before he even got there everything that you have that makes you an individual and you ship it home it's one of the first things you do at Paris Island very traumatic too. And then the everything they give you back, uh, it's all the same. Everybody shaves with the same kind of razor and has the same kind of toothbrush, the same kind of socks. And, uh, there's nothing to distinguish, distinguish you as an individual. That includes rings, watches, cigarette lighters, everything that you have. And that's all getting you down to a basic human being, and then they build you back as a Marine. <laughs> An isolated environment, a new physical appearance, new clothes, a number. So far, the techniques are familiar. To change a man, first change his environment to one you completely control. But the Marines have to work fast. They give themselves only three months to take a kid off the streets and make him one of their own. So they have additional techniques to produce stress and disorientation. First, they keep the recruit busy and in a state of physical exhaustion. Another technique is the threat of brute force. I was in a state of shock initially in boot camp. Oh. A little bit terrified. I, I couldn't quite figure out what they were doing. There was an incident, I, I'm not sure exactly, it was within the first three, four, five days. It was just after we were picked up by our regular DIs. There was a punishment incident where a guy had made a mistake and they punished him. What did they do to him? Uh, made him hold a sea bag over his head. A sea bag? It's a heavy canvas bag, and oh, yeah. all your gear in it, it probably weighs 60, 70 pounds. And they made, made him hold it up over his head until his arms just started doing this. Mm -hmm. And when he collapsed, they beat on him with swagger sticks until he got up enough energy to get back up and hold it up. The guy was up all night long doing that. Mm -hmm. Periodically passing out, vomiting, they'd throw water on him and get him back up with a sea bag over his head, and they just... <clears throat> And he had made a mistake, a very serious mistake. He had struck at a DI. He what? He struck he at him? struck at him. He did not hit him, but uh -huh. he swung at a DI. Uh, and I looked around and I, I, I remembered at that point why people had been punished, or why they had gone out of their way to make an example out of a person. I realized that they had stood out. So I determined at that point that I was going to do everything they told me to do, the best that I could, and would not try and stand out. You got all the privates here? We got all the privates here? Yes, sir! Oh my god, I thought you were dead or something. Like my last class privates? Yes, sir! 
Are we motivated? Yes, sir! Are we dedicated? Yes, sir! Pretty loud for a small series. Alright, alright. Now, Privates, now here we have been down here three months, three months down on beautiful Paris Island with our beloved drone structure. Yeah. Our mother, our father, our sister, our brother, they tell us when to eat, sleep, everything like that, do they not, Privates? Yes, yeah. sir! It was a an elaborate ceremony where our senior drill instructor came out there and he says, because of the changes at Paris Island, we're no longer allowed to touch recruits. We cannot hit you with our hands. And he pulls out his white gloves and he says, that is why we have white gloves. And he started putting on his gloves and at that point everybody got thumped. And from that point on until I got it out of Paris Island, every time I saw those guys pulling those gloves on, you had a little bit of fear inside you. Actually, you develop a really weird sense of loyalty to them. You don't hate them. I mean, you're mad. You know, they push you and you're exhausted and all this type of thing. But it, it's a almost fraternal type of relationship that you develop. Even today, looking back on it, I can't think of anything that, that I would describe as unnecessarily brutal. No. I don't call that brutality. I call that building. And we're going to go home with you. I don't want to see this guy go. I want you to get out there. I want you to be out there. I want you to get on top of me. I want you to get on top of me. I don't want you to get on top of me. I don't want you to get on top of me. Yes, sir. Go, baby. Go, baby. Once you decide to obey all orders, the next step is to obey them without thinking, to simply react. Everything that they taught you in basic training just sets you up to react instantaneously to the right command at a, at a time of crucial pressure, or to obey somebody who was reacting to it. See, that's that pressure, the harassment mentally, the harassment under those pressures, to make a kid stammer and can't get his general orders out, make him so scared that he can't, you know, formulate, to get him over that. Mm. Not get rid of the fear, just get the reaction back into them. To get instant reaction in boot camp is one thing, but that absolute obedience must continue right through the soldier's career, even if it means certain death on the battlefield. That is the real purpose of basic training. Here, the stress, confusion, and physical exhaustion produce a suggestible state, so the idea can be implanted that nothing could give them greater glory than living or dying as a Marine. The United States Marine Corps, just like the Marine Corps Band, is known as the President's Own. We as Marines, by the virtue of us just being there, 205 years of history that speaks for itself, are protectors of our government and our way of life. We as Marines should and do epitomize the very essence of patriotism, democracy, we are saviors and protectors of freedom. And we have been that way since 1775. That is the image we have, and that is the image that we'll keep. Do you understand? Yes, sir! So far, we have seen techniques for changing people who have willingly joined a group 
with prior knowledge of the aims of that group. But is it possible to change people who have no desire to join and who don't know the group's purpose? This is the task of the organization these three young people belong to, the Unification Church. Its members are more commonly called Moonies. I didn't like San Francisco very much. It was sort of, uh, I felt very uncomfortable and I was very anxious to get out. I was being propositioned by you know, pimps and hassled on the street and I just, well, I had to get out. So I got to the bus station and I was, I didn't know where I wanted to go. I thought, well, maybe I'll go to Monterey. I was just sort of looking at the, the board to see, well, where am I going to go? And these two uh, people came up to me. They were really friendly. It was so refreshing after, you know, what I just encountered on the street. I was in a bus station and I met a guy and I'd met a lot of very interesting people on my travels so I wasn't really you know too reluctant to talk to strangers. I'm not a very very open person I just sort of spill everything just to a stranger that I would meet but they seemed very nice and uh, we got into a conversation. We just started walking we talked for about an hour and when my bus was due to leave he convinced me that it would be really good for me if I went to this, you know, ski chalet in the mountains with him and his friends because they were all interested in the same things as I was. We traveled on a bus at night, um, but the lights were on in the bus. So it was funny because I couldn't see out the window. I couldn't see where I was going. The first step has been accomplished. Removal to an isolated shack, an environment the Moonies completely control. I was rather tired. I'd, I'd been traveling and I, I, I was... You know, I, I wanted to sleep, but the next morning, I guess it was about 8 o'clock, everyone started singing and, you know, time to get up and, you know, it, it was such an exciting atmosphere, I, I didn't want to be the only one that, that stayed in bed, so I got up and we went for hikes and we sang songs and played games and I got to meet various people there. And I was just constantly busy, but it never really occurred to me because I just got really caught up in the momentum of the day. And then about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I, I started feeling really strange. I, I, I couldn't put my finger on it. All I know is that I wanted to get a way to think by myself. I was a, a person that I enjoy my solitude. And uh, I hadn't had it for a while, and it was starting to bother me. Even when I tried to go to the washroom and close the door and try to critically think about it, someone would come in and, oh, hi, or, you know, how, how are you doing? And it was very difficult to, to say, no, get away from me because they were so nice and, and loving. I started getting um, almost euphoric. By the second day already, I was feeling this type of high or euphoria, like, hey, you know, I'm really fascinated about this group, but I can't quite put my finger on it. I was intrigued, almost sort of drawn in, that I had to find out what they were about. What are they about? Why the constant group activities, the games, the sing-songs, long hikes in the country, little sleep. Like the Marines, the Moonies know that keeping their recruits busy, never giving them a minute alone, will soften them up for the eventual conversion. The first lecture was quite general. You know, it talked about philosophy and general principles. It introduced God. So that was the first time I realized that it was somewhat of a religious group. I, you know, the guide didn't tell me anything about that. I was there for, what, a day, uh, two days, sitting through these lectures. Now there are more lectures, three a day, lasting two and a half, three hours, with constant activity, never being left alone. Um, I decided um, that I wanted to, to leave. And one of the girls came up to me with this form saying, will you sign this form saying, it, saying that you will stay for seven days? And I said, well, no, I don't want to sign it. I, you know, I only want to stay for a couple. She said, well, there's no bus coming anyway. Like, you can't leave for seven days anyhow. So I went, really? You know, I was told I could leave. No, you know, and I said, well, I'm waiting for my stuff so that I can let, get out of here. Well, it won't come up until, you know, the seven days are up. So, I mean, you're stuck here anyhow. I might as well sign the form. By the end of the weekend, the, each lecture got a little more serious, more bizarre and more into religious principles 
And by the last lecture, which was on the third day after I'd been there, I was told that Christ had returned, he was back on earth, and that all this, all these amazing people and, and the reason for all this happiness and euphoria and love that I felt was because these were specially chosen people who were doing the work of God. And I, w I was quite blown away. A conflict between what they've been brought up to believe and this new belief sets up a battle in the minds of the recruits which can lead to total confusion. Finally, I was alone. There wasn't anyone next to me or anything. I, I'd gotten a break. I was alone. I started thinking, I don't think like this. This isn't me. What am I doing? And then I thought, you know, I have to get out of here. And then another side of me would click in saying, now, Mary, now, come on now. That's just Satan talking to you now. You know you can't leave here. It's important to you. So I had, I had this sort of a dual conversation with myself. And then one side of me was almost in panic going, you know, this is almost like being brainwashed. But to me, the only thing I knew about brainwashing was, uh, well, they lock you up in a cell and they beat you and use torture and um, that kind of thing. This was my understanding of what brainwashing was. I had no understanding at all. In such confusion, it is natural to seek help from others. The only people to turn to are Moonies, and they're ready to exploit your suggestible state. And there would be a lot of intensity on their part, um, saying, please, God, let her feel you and come to her, and I, I pray that she will have this experience. So there was all this suggestion that I, I should feel it, feel God, and everyone else seemed to feel God, so it was, you know, I, I thought, well, you know, it's got to happen sometime. And during this prayer, I just broke down and, and, and I cried for... I don't know, it was a long, long time, I, I, and everything went black, and I, it was just like a, a breakdown of everything. And I did feel something, and I interpreted it as being God. Describe it. This, yeah, the whole thing. It was um, a lot of pain, I felt. It was complete pain, and they said, well, that's God's uh, suffering heart. God has been suffering for humanity for so long, and he's letting you feel that. And it was such a, a deep, intense experience that I thought, well, this must be God. This must be what I'm feeling. So after it was all over, I felt such a sense of euphoria. And from that point on, everything was different. I was much more peaceful. I felt less confused. I, I, felt, I felt like I was floating. And I can remember going into... Uh, a room off the lecture room and just crying and crying and crying till I just passed out on the floor. There was nowhere to sleep anyway. We always slept on the floor. I couldn't eat. I was just so much in distress. Um, it was incredible. I'd never cried quite so hard. Uh, after I sort of finished my crying spell, another Rooney came in and comforted me and saying, well, you know, you should really stay here. And I just said, yeah, I know. En répondant sur elle ton esprit, qu'elle devienne pour nous le corps et le sang de Jésus, le Christ, notre Seigneur. Whatever techniques of suggestion are used to bring about the conversion or personality change, these techniques must be maintained to reinforce the new way of life. The regular repetition of certain rituals helps serve as a constant reminder to the members of the group of their purpose and whom they serve. Vous ferez cela en mémoire de moi. The fact that they have been specifically chosen is stressed, so they are always aware that they are different from everyone else in the outside world. The ultimate aim is to change people so that they can never go back to their old ways of thinking, and to make sure the new value system and new sense of identity are strong enough to make that change last for a lifetime. And it cuts all your family ties. When you're through with that, you'll never go back. In the yeah. same, I mean, yeah. like when I went home on leave, one of the strange things that hit me is I walked up the front door of my house. This is after boot camp and ITR, so you're looking at 18 weeks later, right? Yeah. Went away as a 21 or 20 year old young man living with his parents, okay? And when I came home, walked up that front door, now, what would you do? Well, a normal person would just open it up and walk in. I knocked. And it was a different, you're, that's it, you're cut. 
there's a lot of little catch words and phrases that, that Marines use. For instance, there's no such thing as an ex-Marine. We're former Marines. And all that stuff is drilled into you, and you believe it. I've been away from it since 1969, and I still believe it. You're and still a Marine. I'm still a Marine. An authority figure is the key to the whole process. Members of the group must come to believe that that person and that person alone can give them what they need. Without a living master, no method, however beautiful it is, works. In fact, it is the master's, his bridges, that is the real thing, not the methods. With a alive master, everything works. With a dead master, nothing works. It is not the methods, it is the master, it is the man behind. It is the golden touch, the magical touch of the master. It is his charisma that works. Being with a living master is what works. The group must be made to feel that they are always right, and anyone who disagrees with them is wrong, or better still, evil. After I'd had this breakthrough, they finally allowed me to get away and be alone. And when I did, I felt very frightened. And a car drove by, and I felt like it was trying to run me over. I saw a black cat walk across the street. And normally, that would be a, a, quite a simple thing, but I was afraid. I felt it was Satan. They had me believing that Satan was everywhere. I felt that he was in the car. Now that I'd found God, they told me that Satan would try to do everything they, it, he could to pull me away from the group. So I got really scared, just this car and the cat, and I thought, this is it, I'm going back to safety, to where God is. So I immediately ran back to them, and it, they were my family from that point on. By the fourth week, I was starting to feel some sense of almost a military type of feeling, because there was a lot of songs we would sing about how we're going to fight Satan and um, fight for God and all this kind of uh, feeling. And I know that if I was given an order to take a machine gun and shoot in a five block radius, I would have done it without question. Groups which have all-powerful leaders who control the environment, control all information, and eventually control the way their followers think have one basic thing in common. They have found people who are willing to take that essential first step of surrendering to an authority figure they hope has all the answers. Throughout history, many people have taken that first step, sometimes joining a small group, sometimes a large group, and sometimes a group that engulfs an entire nation. Jésus-Christ, l'enfant du... Oh, oh, oh. 